Well, remember these scary headlines, mandatory budget cuts are risky for the U.S. economy, a threat to jobs, and on and on. Well, maybe not. All those warnings that we heard about widespread furloughs not really materializing. And get this, our federal deficit is actually shrinking. So is this proof it's time for even more cuts, maybe more sequesters? Hi, everybody. I'm David Asin. Welcome to Forbes on Fox. Let's go in focus with the man himself, Mr. Steve Forbes, Rick Unger, John Tamney, Sabrina Schaefer, Elizabeth McDonald, and Morgan Brennan. So, Emac, time for even more cuts. Yeah, I mean, listen, the biggest squawkers found ways to not furlough, to stop the furloughs. Transportation, justice, education, Pentagon. Instead, what they did was they cut. Even the, uh, the government's biggest union found ways to cut the fat and not lay off people. Listen, when the Pentagon is doing Doing uh, war exercises because our debt is so big and warning that our debt is a threat to national security. When the president has added five trillion dollars on his, his watch, when the bond market is saying our interest rates will go up if we continue to add to the debt, we have to do this now. And Rick, we understand that the sequester was arbitrary; that a lot of these cuts uh, were, were done in kind of a sloppy manner. We get that, but but if you leave it up to spineless politicians in the Beltway, you're not going to get anything done. Well, I don't disagree with that, not, not at all. But I do want to point out, look, the results of the sequester maybe aren't as bad as we thought they might be, and that's great. There's one area I'm deeply concerned about. There are headlines all out all this week pointing out what the sequester is doing to our national science investment, and they're calling it we're entering the dark ages of American science. That's a shame. We should keep our eye on that. Now, as to the... By the way, you really think we're entering the dark well, I know, ages? I know we science? are. I am, I am actually aware. I keep up on these. I am actually aware of important <laughs> medical research that's been going on, you know, driven towards pharmacology. They've come to a screeching halt in the middle of their program. That, that might also the money be because of there. Obamacare as well. Well, it's not worry because of that. Obamacare, so don't say that. Our, no, well, it true. may be. It's Morgan, Morgan the bottom the line is that, that we're not really sure uh, exactly how dangerous. We, one thing we are sure about is that the sequester itself was not as bad as we were being told it was, right? Yeah, it wasn't as bad. That's great news. But I say proceed with caution here because it still has been a drag on economic growth. And it's very likely we're going to see another round of sequester with the Senate uh, going over its legal spending limit later this year. Um, that being said, I, I think we really need to be smart in how we cut our spending. We need to target. It needs to be reforms. And the right. area that needs it most is entitlements and health care. Who's going to do those reforms? You really believe that Congress is up to it, that the president and Congress can work together for smart, targeted cuts? We haven't seen any evidence of that smartness inside the Beltway recently, have we? N uh, not except the sequester, but I do think if you look at the numbers, the CBO projects that Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare, the spending there is up $73 billion over last year. Those are the areas we need to target. Baby steps, let's move right. in that direction for long-term cuts in spending. Is, is cutting spending, cutting government spending a drag on the economy? No, just the opposite. It stimulates the economy. That's one reason why we're going to get a little bit of growth this year. Where does the government get the money to spend? It gets it from taxing, borrowing, or printing of money, which is another form of taxation. So by leaving more resources in the hands of people who can use it productively, we all benefit from it. This is where less government is more for the rest of us. And Sabrina, you have some very specific places to cut even more, right? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I couldn't agree more with Morgan about where we really need to cut, which is our entitlement programs, but there's plenty of other places where we can start. I mean, look, we know that obesity rates are down, so let's nix that USDA and that CDC um, anti-obesity program. Let's get rid of those Obama phones, many of whom are being given to people yeah. who cannot actually demonstrate that they need um, they need a phone. What about the $20 billion in farm subsidies, most of which are mm. going to large, wealthy farmers? There are so many places that we could cut from the budget. I'm sure everyone here has their their pet project that they'd like to axe. And, <laughs> uh, John, once again, everybody was screaming bloody murder when the sequester came about, but think of the, the discretionary spending. I hate that term, but that's what they, they use for, the, for what really went up tremendously during President Obama's first term in office. In 2011, discretionary spending increased $1.3 trillion. We had a $1.3 trillion increase there. I mean, that's, that's a huge amount of money. It had to go down. 
Well, yeah, this is basic economics. When government is consuming less in the way of capital, it's released to the private sector where it goes into real production. And the one thing I would say is we maybe want to get it off the deficit and talk about the raging forest fire, which is the size of government. What that truly represents is Microsofts and Intels that will never be created, cancer cures and heart disease cures you will never see, and transportation innovations that will never happen. Cut government spending because we want the economy to grow and we want better things and more liberty, too. So Rick, John is saying that if you have more government spending, it'll crowd out the research that you're it's, rightly concerned about in the private sector. Except that we know, and this is, you can't even argue this, we know this for a fact that that's simply not true. If you look at most of the cancer, you can laugh, it's, you know, I don't know how you dispute that one. We know that most of the cancer discoveries, most of these cures you're talking about, John, are the direct result of government participation and funding. And they wouldn't without we, government spending? Well, I can't tell you what would have happened or wouldn't have, but we do know. No, no, let me finish. We, we do know that this. Well, I'm going to finish. We do know that it was that spending that has led to these cures to suggest cutting it out. Hold which on is what's a second. Happening. Is that true, Emma? Crazy. I hear. No, I hear Rick is saying it's a public-private partnership. Yes, a lot of NIH research grants went out, but I'm saying the private sector was in there big time helping develop the cures that we need today. The, 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 listen, broad zoom perspective, what John is also talking about is the U.S. dollar. When you have a stronger U.S. dollar, you have foreign manufacturers coming here to build plants, and that creates jobs here in the United States because then they can report their right. profits back home and, and bigger but uh, Steve, amounts. I hear Rick's <laughs> argument all the time from people who like big government involvement in things like like medicine and research. They say without big government involvement, we wouldn't have. Well, look at a place like England, for example, which has almost full government involvement in healthcare. How much new research are they creating? How many new discoveries are they creating compared to our economy, which is more private sector? Well, when you get socialized medicine, what you do is you uh, kill research for the future, which is why the pharmaceutical industry in Europe is uh, withered away. And in this country, in terms of what NIH does, that's a teeny part of the budget. If you want to wall that off, I can find $200 billion in the rest of the <laughs> government that's easily true. to cut. And right. Milton Friedman was right. He said he'd rather have a $1 trillion budget that was unbalanced than it, this shows how far back this goes, but a $2 trillion that is balanced, he'd prefer the $1 trillion versus the 2 and the reason is it takes resources out of the economy. John is right. Morgan, that's the bottom line, is that there may be good things to spend money on, but when you're taking it out of the private economy, does that help, one, the economy, and two, innovation? Uh, I agree with everybody on this panel, but I also, going back to my point, we can have arguments about little areas, smaller areas to cut. We can have arguments about things like debt ceilings and sequester. At the end of the day, it all comes back to entitlements. You want to balance the economy moving forward for the next generations. Take a look at that. And John, I, not, I know you're not terribly concerned about the deficit in general. You don't like big government spending, but the deficit doesn't scare you. But with that big deficit, it's taxpayers that have to pay for the interest on that deficit, right? That's not a good thing. I don't like doing that. I would almost rather them pay interest than the government discovering new programs. But, you know, getting back mm. to Rick's point, would you prefer Genentech and Pfizer and Merck to c discover a cure for cancer, or would you prefer government? I mean, it's so logical. Rick, what's the answer to that? Answer that. What Market I prefer, discipline here. Hold on. Answer it. Also, it. it also what, go ahead, Rick. What I, somebody's talking. What Just I, a second, Sabrina. What I ahead. prefer is whatever gets the job done. Go ask Genentech. <laughs> go ask Genentech how much wait of minute, what they... No, wait. Let me finish. You asked me the question. Right. Go ask Genentech how much of what they've accomplished has been with the assistance of those government funds. Very quick, email. Listen, in socialist economies, you don't see the major American brands like we have. They're soft economic power. You don't see it in China or socialist countries. There's a reason for that because of the private sector. That's the last word. Coming up next, our Keystone Pipeline protests like this soon to become an endangered species. What a new report says about the pipeline that could actually shut the protesters down and stop the president from saying things like this. They keep on talking about this, uh, an oil pipeline coming down from Canada that's estimated to create about 50 permanent jobs. That's not a jobs plan. Allowing the Keystone Pipeline to be built requires a finding that doing so would be in our nation's interest. And our national interest will be served only if this project does not significantly exacerbate the problem of carbon pollution. Well, did we just find out the Keystone Pipeline is not a pollution problem? There's a new report out revealing the proposal to expand it will not impact greenhouse gas emissions. And Steve, you say this makes it impossible for the president to justify delaying the project any longer. 
Yeah, for a normal president, this would be absolutely true. But this president, for his own ideological reasons, will try to come up with a new way to delay the thing. But I'd rather have oil going through pipelines than on trains. Yep. And if investors are willing to finance it, go with it. It's good for us. Less oil from Venezuela, good all around. Rick, the bottom line of this report is it says because if, if we don't do the pipeline, we're going to have to substitute all that oil with stuff from, from Venezuela, which is dirty oil. Yeah, and let's be careful here. I, that is absolutely true. And what that report really was talking about was carbon pollution. And what they said is correct. If we don't have the pipeline, we're going to have the same amount of carbon pollution as a result of Venezuela. However, there is other much more important pollution in my mind, and that is what it does to the groundwaters. I will say what I've been saying all along. We shouldn't be debating this. We should be asking the people who live along the proposed Which pipeline what they think. we have been doing think. all along, and in fact, now the people of Nebraska agree that they're in favor of the project, even though a lot of them if weren't at first. I'm for it. John, what do you think? Well, I want to go back to a great Steve Forbes fact and comment from years ago. He talked about Ooh, the environmentalism and worries about global warming, calling it a massive human delusion. And I would throw <laughs> in that it's an arrogant delusion also. In this case, if you want to fix the environment, the best way to do it is to grow the economy. If the private sector wants this, this will lead to a healthier economy. Healthy economies are the ones that have the best environments. All right, but Morgan, hasn't the president already set out the parameters by which he would approve or disapprove of it? And now from this report, we find out by his own parameters, it should be approved. I would agree it should be, but I think he's been putting out a lot of mixed messages here. If the president really wanted to pick a bone with a Keystone pipeline, the argument he can make is that this will drive up prices as infrastructure makes the price of WTI go through the roof, which is something we're already starting to see. Now, that being said, this oil is going to leave those sands one way or the other. This will create jobs. We've already seen the southern leg of the pipeline create 4,000 construction jobs. These are construction jobs in the industries that haven't been seeing work, unlike the residential yeah. construction side, and I think this is a Thing we should just but he made, the president says it only create 50 permanent jobs. He's totally wrong. I <laughs> yes. mean, talk, this, talk about noise pollution. That's what I'm annoyed with with the president. And by the way, it won't we haven't raise, talked about noise pollution. That's a good point. A lot of noise pollution coming out of the White House. Listen, and by the way, it won't raise prices, lower prices. Here's even the president's yeah. own energy department has said 167,000 jobs have been created in oil and net gas since 2007. Not the 50 he's talking about. And why is it that it's always government spending that has a multiple Multiplier effect and not private <laughs> sector growth has a multiplier effect and tax cuts. Tax cuts so listen to this: the multiplier effect are restaurants, health services, law, uh, legal, oil and that gas services will crop up around she this this up. oil and that gas oh, wow. industry. I didn't, I, yeah, I didn't want to hold her up. back at all. So, yeah. are you as fired up? I am. I'm, I'm, Sabrina. <laughs> <laughs> I am pretty fired up. I mean, look, I think we all know that the only reason we haven't seen this pipeline come to fruition yet is because this is a president who's trying to, you know, appease the very far left of his of his Democratic base. I mean, this has nothing to do with whether this is environmentally safe or whether it's going mm. to create jobs. We know it's going to create thousands of jobs, let alone the, the, the trickle-down jobs that should come from this. No wonder the people of Nebraska are enthusiastic about this. And Steve, um, this is... This this is this pipeline has been better studied than any pipeline in history by far. Isn't it time to put an end to the study and say, okay, we've done enough study, it's time to go ahead? Uh, <laughs> obviously, we should have done this four years ago, but extreme environmentalists, David, don't want the pipeline. They don't want advancement. They don't want economic development. They hate carbon. They hate coal. We, they want to take us back to the Stone Age. Well, I don't want Mr. to do President, that. Mr. President, when Rick Unger is in favor of this thing, it's time to but, turn but around. I like massive yeah. human delusions. <laughs> and you like noise pollution, too. Okay, You're the embodiment well, of it, Rick. Pov we got to move on. Poverty is now growing at a faster pace in American suburbs, despite all those government handouts. And someone on Cash and In says it's because of all the government handouts across America. That's at the bottom of the hour, but first, right here on Forbes, grounded. The Justice Department trying to slam the brakes on that American U.S. Air merger. Is that good or bad news for flyers? We'll debate. You decide. You know, there's not a lot of love for the airlines these days, particularly as they squeeze you into smaller seats and charge you for extra bags. So when the Justice Department announced this week that it's trying to block a merger between American Airlines and U.S. Airways, few came to the airline's defense. But could the government's plan end up backfiring on travelers and the worker for, workers for these companies, Steve? 
Absolutely. The reason for the merger is to make sure these two airlines survive. American Airlines is already in bankruptcy trying to emerge from it. They would have a combined share of only 25 percent. The real reason the government is opposing this, David, is because Reagan Airport, there would be a huge domination by the two. And that's where those people from Justice Department go. They allowed the United Continental merger. They urged the Delta Northwest merger. But this one, suddenly they get antsy. It's pure politics. All right. So, Rick, this is one of those NIMBY things, not in my backyard. <laughs> Yeah, it, it may be. I mean, I actually see Steve's point. But at the same time, we are seeing some pretty negative results of these mergers. Prices keep going up. Uh, convenience goes down. Uh, schedules are getting worse. I actually agree with the Justice Department on this one. This one's too big. Well, Not I a suspect good idea. that John Tamney agrees with neither you nor the Justice Department. Am I right, John? <laughs> We've reentered Rick's parallel universe here. But back <laughs> in the real world, since Massive 1978, 196 airlines have gone through bankruptcy in the last 10 years, both U.S. Air and American have. Which would we prefer, companies that are profitable and successful or companies that are constantly going out of business or going through bankruptcy? Let them merge. Well, Emac, the point is, is that we may not like those crowded seats, but at least we're going where we want to go. If the airlines didn't exist, or these ones in particular, we wouldn't be going anywhere. Yeah, I'll tell you something. You know, this is such a tough debate, and you're absolutely right, David. And, you know, there is a reason why there's cabin pressure on these stocks, though, not so much in the upright position, is because they've lost $58 billion over By the, the way, last let, let's just put up those stock figures, because this week, when the Justice Department announced they weren't going to allow the merger, guess what? The American Airlines and U.S. Air stock went way down, and all the airline stocks went down. So you're right. They, it did have an effect. However, I am worried about lack of competition. 47% of the time, airfares went up. And when you have consolidation, I hate to say this, uh, the, there is a tendency to that prices do go up. You see in the telecom industry, you've seen it before in other industries. So, Sabrina, is the Justice Department right or wrong about this merger? Well, I think I'm a little bit with Liz on this one. I mean, look, the airlines have been unprofitable for about a decade now, losing $58 million. I, I don't think that they have much of a choice. I think they're between a rock and a hard place here. If we want to see, you know, things get better in the airlines, and I've been one to scream at the ticket counter, um, I think that we do need to see, first and foremost, healthy, healthy companies. Well, Steve, again, recently a lot of people will say, critics of the airlines will say recently they've been making a lot of money which may be true, but that's only to make up for the past losses, is it not? Uh, David, for 100 years, this industry has been losing money. David Crandall, the former chairman of American Airlines, once said on the 100th anniversary of the Wright brothers, he said so, he wished somebody had shot the Wright brothers down. Uh, because the, the, only, the only people, every, everyone makes money in that industry except the carriers. The manufacturers make it, the financiers make That's it, true. engine makers make it, the food services make it. Carriers usually lose it. This is one of those rare periods where they're actually in the black. And, and, and Rick, Richard Branson, the head of Virgin, he said, if you want to make a million dollars, you start with a billion and then start an airline. And that's, that's the, way. I mean, the, the, the bottom line here, and it's to John Tamney's point, that without any airline at all, we wouldn't be flying. I, I'm much more interested in knowing why when Liz and I said virtually the same thing, Sabrina only agreed with Liz. But, you know, <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll let it go by. Now, Branson did say that. It is a tough business, but, you know, it, this merger would just be too big. There wouldn't be enough left. There wouldn't be competition. <laughs> David, the amazing thing is, even though this is a capital-intensive industry, it gets new entrants all the time because the financiers Absolutely. and the manufacturers, uh, plane manufacturers will finance you. Who do you think is smarter, the government or the free market. You decide. Oh, that's While U.S. Airways <laughs> stock got grounded over this news, 